Meet Charles Coquel, astrobiologist, a friend of mine. He's at the University of Edinburgh, the cold place. I met him about 10 years ago at a conference in Arizona. We went to see Biosphere 2 together. And he's a very nice guy. And he has also produced an astrobiology MOOC on Coursera called Astrobiology in the Search for Extraterrestrial Life. He's written many excellent papers, and he's written these two books. Here's a textbook on astrobiology, and here's a more recent book about how physics shapes evolution. I sat down with him during a pause in an astrobiology conference, and we talked about Are We Alone? Uh, I'm Charles Coquel. All right, what do you do? I, uh, I'm at the University of Edinburgh, and I'm an astrobiologist, but with a focus on microbiology. I study microbes in extreme environments. You study microbes in a group. All right, Are We Alone? Are we alone? I mean, I, people love to make predictions on this. And I always say, I don't know. And people say, you're sitting on a fence. But I think my response to that is, we truly don't know. And that is a correct scientific answer. It is a question we don't have an answer to. Uh, we want to find out. I think as um, astrobiology has developed, one of the most astonishing things over the last few decades is the discovery of watery environments in the universe, in our own solar system, in our icy moons and the discoveries of exoplanets. So we're certainly getting closer to maybe having some sort of answer, at least in our local neighborhood. But uh, the fact is, at the moment, we don't know what the answer to that is. And that's why we're interested in pursuing astrobiology. Do you have a favorite solution to Fermi's paradox? Yeah, I, I, I do. I mean, again, one of those questions that's interesting, there's no real good data. So sort of wild speculation. I happen to think that the distances between stars are just so vast that one explanation for the Fermi paradox is that these distances are just too great to communicate or travel over. I mean, at the moment, there's no good physics to suggest that we really can communicate or go faster than the speed of light. Uh, and so when you think about the distances between stars, it just seems like a very difficult thing to do. I think we live... So the analogy I would give is this, and it's a slightly philosophical analogy. When you're young, you think you can achieve anything. And then at some point, you realize that you're mortal. <laughs> and that you're going to die. And if I was to say to you, oh, I, I really want to be around to see what's happened in astrobiology in 300 years' time, you're not going to say to me, well, stop being so negative. You should have a more positive view of your future. You just accept the fact that it's not going to happen. As a civilization, we currently have this view that we're immortal. We're going to build a spacefaring civilization, travel across the galaxy, meet other civilizations. And for that reason, we sit around scratching our heads thinking, the Fermi paradox, what's that about? It doesn't, it doesn't fit with our view of our future. Maybe at some point we're going to have to confront the fact that the laws of physics to set a glass ceiling to our technological capacities and traveling thousands or tens of thousands of light years uh, to other stars or even communicating with other intelligences is just not possible to do. If you live in it, maybe there are a few civilizations out there in star clusters where they're close enough to one another that there's communication. There may well be civilizations out there with the privilege to talk to one another. But it may be that the more common aspect or the, the more common outcome is that there are intelligences that sort of flicker in and out across the galaxy over time, but they never communicate with one another. And I think there's a real possibility that we will explore our solar system. We may even launch interstellar missions to our nearest stars. Uh, we may go slightly beyond. But that might be it. And our civilization may be destined to live out its life and die primarily in the solar system. And I think that's something that um, a lot of people are not willing to accept. But it would be, for me at least, the most logical and parsimonious explanation for the Fermi paradox. Because it fits with the laws of physics. It fits with these vast distances. and. Um, uh, and the problems of, of traveling and communicating over these sorts of distances. I think somebody who's teasingly referred to bioastronomy or astrobiology as a discipline without a subject matter. Uh, what, do you, what do you say about that? Um, I, I would go back to the point that it's not just about searching for aliens. Um, uh, it's about understanding life on Earth. So we have quite a lot of subject matter. In fact, over three and a half billion years worth of subject matter. If you go out and look at the diversity of life on Earth uh, and try to understand where it came from, there's quite a lot to look at. But the other thing I would say is that um, as we, we start to explore other planets, the, the discovery of the lack of life is not no data. That's data. The discovery of even a planet like Venus, you know, planets in our own solar system that we, well, 
we think are lifeless. I mean, there are some people that argue otherwise for Venus, but let's just ignore that for the point of, for the for the moment, and, and simply point out there are planets that do not have life in our in our solar system. That's astrobiological data. It's about understanding the limits of life and the environments in which life might have emerged. So again, I've never really understood the point it's a subject without any data apart from the obvious trivial observation that we haven't got aliens. But that, I think, is a rather facile view of, of astrobiology and, and the study of the universe and biology's place in the universe. So we've solved the universe's problems. Getting there. <laughs> <laughs> A few more beers yet and we'll be there. <laughs>